Please rise as you are able and join me in our call to worship. May your way may be known upon earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Please join me in our opening prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, overwhelm us and fulfill us. Inspire us and guide us in your ways of love, justice, and mercy. Renew our hearts, open our minds, re-energize our spirits to seek and find you around us and to know you are within us. War, mass shootings, and other terrible news of the world continues to discourage, but you lift us up on the wings of eagles. Your Holy Spirit catches us at the first breath of dawn and does not let us go. Help us when we feel stagnant and stuck in despair, drowning in the losses of this world. Breathe new life in us and remind us that you are the one who truly makes all things new. Amen and amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. And loving God, as we come to worship this day, we are thankful that you fill all things with a fullness and a hope that is hard for us to fully comprehend. Thank you for leading us into a time where more of reality is unveiled for us to see. And may this be a time when our natural temptation for cynicism, denial, fear, or despair is replaced by forgiveness, reconciliation, and mutual concern. Through Christ, you are our model for forgiveness and grace. And may we learn these lessons of the heart so that we may live into your love and grace. Just as you called Abraham and Sarah to leave the familiar and embark into an uncertain future, so we too seek to follow you, though the way is not always clear. Indeed, during these days, we also are embarking on a journey of faith as we look forward to a new beginning under new leadership. And during these days, prepare us to welcome Pastor Darrell and Tammy. May they know that they are coming to a community that is prepared to love and support them as together we move into an exciting future. Holy One, we admit that our path is seldom straight as we are easily distracted by desires that do not fulfill us, dreams that are unworthy, idols that cater to our wants without meeting our deepest needs. We confess that our fears too often overcome our faith. And so we pray that you will lift before us that vision of our high calling to love and serve as Jesus did, always putting the needs of the outcast and the most vulnerable before himself. And caring God, whose heart is the first to break in the face of human suffering, find us in solidarity this day with all who have been touched by violence, prejudice, or hatred, especially those affected by the horrific racial targeting in Buffalo. Words and ideas matter. And so help us to reaffirm our individual commitment to let no act of hatred or prejudice go unchallenged in our presence, even as we pray for leadership that will lead our nation to do the same. May we adopt the mind of Christ, O oh God, as we seek to live in a way of kindness that heals the wounds and hurts of our world, a way of peacemaking that settles strife, a way of justice-seeking that creates hope. Draw us, O oh God, deeper into that kind of faithfulness that leads us into a new way of living, even as we pray for all who are in need of healing in body and spirit, as together we gather all of our prayers into that prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning. All right. Our scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9, and verse 21 through chapter 4, verse 5. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each your task. I planted the seed, Apollo swatted it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, 
and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. So let no one boast about people, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Think of us in this way as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. I do not even judge myself. I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive commendation from God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my friends, the end game has begun and a new beginning is on the horizon. This interim between A permanent senior pastor has taken longer than expected and, of course, has been complicated by COVID. But now, thanks to the diligence and the competence of your search committee, it looks like God has answered your prayers for that special person who will come and who will love you and lead you into God's future. And as you know... I've done this dance a number of times, and so for the next few weeks, I want to reflect with you about what a new beginning might look like. And I think that a good place to start is with this passage in 1 Corinthians, because here, Paul is writing to a divided church that's hungry for positive leadership. Now, let's not press the comparison too far because I don't see Park as a divided church. But we know that it is human nature to have favorites, whether it's a favorite teacher or friend or minister. But when that happens in the church, we often find competing factions developing. And in the case of the church at Corinth, This seemed to be a real danger, a real danger that would not only divide the church, but also undermine its influence. Now, earlier in chapter 3, Paul is trying to help them to understand that, that it's not about power. It's not about control. But rather, it's about the gifts that God gives us to do the job. When Paul writes that I planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now, apparently, the problem was that as people gave allegiance to a particular leader, competition occurred that resulted in in division. And here Paul is attacking the problem in a rather personal way. He he knows that, that some have chosen sides and are no doubt arguing about their leadership 
preference, and you can almost hear them arguing. I like Apollos because his sermons are better. I like Cephas because he's more approachable. I, I like Paul because he's more persuasive and, and decisive. But here, Paul is trying to level the playing field by saying, no, no, you've got it all wrong. We're, we're not in competition here. It is about all of us using the gifts that we have been given to build up the whole church. You're thinking it's all wrong, says Paul. It's not about being an authoritarian leader who demands blind obedience, but rather you need to think of us as servants and as stewards. Now, frankly, that was a definition of leadership that was relatively unknown in that world of kings and monarchs. It was a top-down world where the nature of an egalitarian church was revolutionary. Not much in their experience prepared them for a church where there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. Actually, it can be argued that things haven't changed that much. While such equality is still our ideal, we also live in a hierarchical world that too often defaults into top-down leadership. Now, 25 years ago, uh, Robert Greenleaf wrote a book entitled Servant Leadership, which tried to define what a, what a different kind of approach to, to leadership might look like. Now, Servant leadership has a nice ring to it, but how do you know? How, how do you know when you're trying to be a servant leader? Now, in his book, Greenleaf lays out four principles of servant leadership. First, a servant leader encourages diversity of thought. Now, while that may seem obvious to, to a church like Park, most institutions have a gravitational pull toward sameness, toward agreement. And I have to admit that I prefer having people agree with me rather than having them argue with me. But the truth is that's a, a demon that I am constantly trying to exercise because growth never comes when one is surrounded with sycophants. Now, one experience comes to mind. A person who had been nominated to serve on our church board asked to see me. And she was a highly respected person in, in the congregation, and it was not a surprise to me that she had been nominated. But I was surprised when she told me that because she disagreed with me on one of the important issues that was facing the congregation, at that time, she assumed that I would rather not have her on the church board. Now, unfortunately, I found that that assumption is all too common. It, it's, and I finally, as after we talked, I finally convinced her to serve, and she did. And I don't think she ever changed her mind about that issue upon which we disagreed, but we became dear friends. Now, the second principle of servant leadership, as offered by Greenleaf, was that, that a servant leader creates a culture of trust. And friends, that is not as easy as it may sound, because it takes time. It brings to mind advice that I once received from a mentor when I asked, what does it take to be a successful minister? And he said to me simply, Riley, you've just got to love the people. And after about three years, they'll start loving you back. <laughs> and what happens in those three years is that you build a culture of trust. Now, the third principle of servant leadership is that a servant leader has an unselfish mindset. It brings to mind to my mind, at least, that famous dictum of Harry Truman's, the buck stops here. We have too many examples of leaders whose first instinct is to blame someone else. A true leader 
A true leader is one who creates a culture where success has many names. As someone has said, when you don't care who gets the credit, it's amazing what can happen. And finally, according to uh, Robert Greenleaf, a servant leader is one who fosters leadership in others. I believe that one of the great joys of parenting is to watch your children grow into adulthood and exceed whatever benchmarks you may have set as they exhibit kindness, intelligence, and competence as they make a positive impact on their world. And as it relates to the church, I, I have always asked my congregations to, to think of me as an enabler an enabler helping them to discover their gifts and to use them to promote the reign of God. And I would often say with conviction that there was someone in the church that could, that could do every part of my job better than I could do it. And my job was to help those people, to help those people exercise their gifts for the glory of God. And if I did that, I would always have a job. Now, a second part of the job description as Paul is outlining it is, a leader is a steward. A leader is a steward of the mysteries of God. Now, steward is not a word that we use much very much these days, unless we're traveling on a, on a cruise ship. One of the translations I consulted used the word manager instead of, of steward, but somehow manager of the mysteries of God just doesn't quite do it for me. That makes me think of a, a paper shuffler organizing a filing cabinet. A stronger approach would be to think caretaker or guardian. And a further understanding would be not to allow the mysteries of God to be domesticated, which is a constant temptation when we handle the holy. Now, a quick, quick illustration. In many traditions, only ordained clergy are allowed to officiate at the communion table. And since those same traditions believe in the priesthood of all believers, this can seem like we're creating an unnecessary hierarchy. And some years ago, I was, I was part of a, a wedding where the couple asked a friend who was not an ordained minister to give them communion as part of their wedding service. And when we got to the communion part of the service, the uninitiated officiant went to the table and he picked up the, the bread and the cup and he said, you know, it's been a long day for our bride and groom. They got up really early and they really didn't have much breakfast or a whole lot of lunch. And so what do we have here but a little bread and, and some juice? Well, friends, let me just say, that is not the way you introduce the holy mystery of communion. You see, to be a steward of the mysteries of God is to handle the holy with reverence and with respect. These are the wonders of God's work that we don't fully understand yet. Think of, think of words like grace and unconditional love. To be a steward of such wonders means to faithfully proclaim the gospel in our particular context, to build each other up in, in the faith, and to keep alive a witness to the love and the justice of a faithful God. Now, a final theme, as Paul is trying to flesh out the kind of leadership necessary in the church, is judgment. Now, Paul isn't worried about God's judgment here. Actually, he welcomes it. No, as he addresses a divided church, he's concerned about the judgmental way that they can be with each other and with their leaders, how judgmental they can be in those situations. Now, now let it be said that judgmentalism can't be avoided in the church or any other organization. 
in the church, we all have our opinions. But the key is how we share them. How we share them in love or with an overlay of disapproval. If Paul was on Park's personnel committee, he would tell our new pastor, don't let the critics get you down. And don't even be too hard on yourself because the ultimate job, the ultimate judge of a job well done is God and time. Now we know that that in the short term, accountability is important in most churches and most organizations have an evaluation process. But as one friend of mine says, the best evaluation process is about glows and grows. That is what is being done well and how can we improve. Now Paul says it's a small thing to be judged by you. But the truth is that most of us hear our critics out of proportion to our supporters. But the negative should not immobilize us, but rather become cause for self-reflection and accountability. And we call it growth because none of us is perfect. Now to that end, the ministry to which Paul is calling the church at Corinth is a mutual ministry. Now, certainly leaders are called who have special gifts for ministry in the church, but that ministry is always, always seen as mutual. In fact, when you install Daryl Kistler as your new pastor, you as a congregation will be asked two questions. Will you promise to labor with him in the ministry of the gospel and to give him due honor and support? And secondly, will you participate with him in a mutual ministry in Christ's name? And when you say yes, when you say yes to those two questions, you will be sealing a covenant that will enable you to affirm in the words of the old gospel hymn, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. You see, new beginnings are always uncertain. But when you have laid the proper groundwork, and you have, and, and when you trust each other, and you do, and when you believe that God is in it, and God is, then you can be confident that you are, are entering an exciting and productive future in the life of Park Church. May it be so. Amen.
Following Christ means following love into magical moments where everything is sparkly and supernatural, like the feeling of bare feet in hot, rich garden soil. It also means following love in the places where it is hard to find love, in the hospitals where exhausted doctors and nurses and staff face the seemingly endless enemy called COVID. In all places, we are called to see the love and call it out, to be the love and amplify it. One way we do this is by having a place where we fuel up for the work ahead. That is our church and worship services. Then we go out in love. This is our missions and services that we do locally, regionally, and internationally. Everywhere, being the love and amplifying the love present already. Ushers, please come as we give to care for our congregation and our community.
Please join me in our prayer of dedication. God, you are one. One God manifest in many different ways. God, we are one. One family made of many different people. We offer our gifts today as one. Many different gifts of time, abilities, and finances. We pray you bless all the different givers and receivers with your one perfect love. Amen. Would you join me now in our common commission, sending us into the world to be the people of God. Let us now go forth into the world in peace, being of good courage, holding fast to that which is good, rendering to no one evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted, honoring all people, loving and serving the Lord, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Mm -hmm. 